joining me in welcoming our speaker. So I want to warn in advance that this is going to be a little bit of an unorthodox talk. Um, if you came in today thinking, I'm really excited to see an orthodox talk, you may, you may be disappointed. And it's unorthodox in, in two ways. So one is just the structure of the talk. We are actually going to talk about 15 ways of looking at a pointing gesture. And then the second way is um, in the aims of the talk. And I think you'll get a sense for, for what I mean by that as we, as we go on. So Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci <coughs> had a number of obsessions, as you may know. He was obsessed with anatomy. He was obsessed with optics. He was obsessed with water. He was obsessed with trees. And according to um, his most recent biographer, Walter Isaacson, he was also obsessed with the human pointing gesture. So if you look across his body of work, you'll often notice these figures pointing to other figures in the frame or outer frame. You see it in the Virgin on the Rocks. Um, you see it in one of his most famous sketches, The Pointing Lady. You see it in um, St. John the Baptist uh, with this upward swooping finger. And this gesture was such a characteristic of his painting that when his contemporary Raphael wanted to um, kind of paint an homage to Leonardo in his School of Athens painting, he cast him in the role of Plato here on the left and he showed him with an um, upward pointing gesture. So why was Leonardo obsessed with pointing? Why would a mind that was so expansive and covered so many different spheres and domains be interested in such a humble and, you may be thinking, boring gesture? Well, we, we of course can't answer this for sure, but it does seem like he had this sort of long-standing interest in the postures of the human hand and um, how they were able to express subtleties of, of emotion. He also had a lifelong interest in aspects of communication, which came in part through his interactions with a deaf associate. But ultimately, this is, this is just sort of speculation. Um, we, we can't say for sure what drew him to it. But we can say that he's not the only one who saw something special in pointing. Um, as we'll see today, it's attracted minds from across disciplines. So before we, we start to talk about these different aspects of pointing, I first just want to um, have us get us all on the same page with the working definition. So what I mean by pointing in this talk is um, a movement toward some region of space which serves to direct someone's attention to that region. Okay, it's a, it's a um, way that someone intends to direct another's attention. And many commentators also talk about a special property of pointing being that it seems to project an imaginary form. You sort of imagine some kind of line or vector projecting from a pointing gesture. So we're going to talk about um, 15 different ways beyond this sort of basic definition that pointing has been understood across different disciplines. So we're going to talk about how it's been seen in semiotics and philosophy, um, how it's been understood in gesture studies and linguistic anthropology in um, spoken language linguistics as well as sign language linguistics, in studies of visual culture, in um, psychology and different, uh, the different um, branches of psychology, and finally in com um, comparative psychology and biological anthropology. Um, now, I asked Erica if I could have a four-hour slot, and she said, no, thank you. So I'm um, mercifully going to really focus us more closely on five of these different ways in particular for today's audience. We are going to cover all of them, but we're going to delve a little deeper into these five. Okay, so without further ado, let's start with how pointing has been seen as a kind of semiotic primitive. So in 1800, Joseph Marie de Girondo, um, a long forgotten proto-anthropologist, wrote this manual for explorers who are visiting uh, distant lands and he talked about how you should try to communicate with native peoples. And he wrote that really you should resort to the language of action, i.e. to gesture. And in particular, he recommended that you use pointing gestures because they're the gesture, um, they're the gesture whose effect is most sure. And he went on to say that you really should only use any other device when you cannot point. 
a little bit later in the 19th century, Wilhelm Wundt, the um, German psychologist, also was interested in pointing, and he regarded it as the simplest and also the most primary gesture in our effort to communicate. So pointing has long been seen as, among the different classes of gesture, the kind of simplest one. But it's also been seen more broadly as, among the ways that humans can mean for each other, one of the simplest devices we have. So for example, um, Charles Peirce, in his, in his um, pioneering work on semiotics, distinguished these three different ways that signs can mean, um, three different sign types, rather, I should say indices, icons, and symbols. And <clears throat> the main distinction here, as many of you will be familiar with, is between indexes, which draw attention to their reference just through some sort of, sort of spatial temporal continuity, icons, which um, evoke their reference through some sort of resemblance, perceptual resemblance, and symbols, which evoke their reference through some sort of And in his class of indices, he included um, things like lightning bolts and knocks on the door and so on, and of course also pointing gestures. And he wrote that what all these have in common is that they sort of direct attention to their reference by some kind of blind compulsion. So again, pointing isn't the only type of index in, in Peirce's um, trichotomy, far from it, but it is a sort of prototype. I don't really consider myself a Percian, but I do certainly consider myself a Clarkian. So Herb Clark, um, Stanford psychologist, basically took Peirce's um, three-way distinction and he refined it and simplified it into this, uh, these three methods of communicating. So he's really focused on the case of um, intentional overt communication, how we basically have three different methods by which we can mean things for others. Namely, we can indicate them and then we can describe them using symbols. And so in Herb Clark's trichotomy, pointing is a sort of prototypical way of indicating. It's not the only one. You can also hold something up, um, and so on. But it is, again, a sort of prototypical index. OK. So pointing may be a semiotic primitive, but it's not always straightforward. And in fact, for as long as people have been talking about how simple pointing is, they've also noticed some complexities to it. And in particular, a lot of these complexities um, center on this, this um, scene, we might call it, of, of early language learning. So one of the first descriptions of this scene is given to us by uh, St. Augustine, who in his Confessions um, wrote, when my elders named some object and I accordingly moved towards some Sorry, when my elders named some object and accordingly moved towards something, I saw this and I grasped the thing. I grasped that the thing was called by the sound they uttered when they meant to point it out. So this is his account of how he came to learn language. Basically, my elders pointed to things and named them. All right. So this is what is commonly called language learning by ostension. And many philosophers have um, questioned whether one could ever really learn language in this way. So most fam famously, Wittgenstein talking about um, this possibility, wrote a piece of paper, now point to its shape, now point to its color. How do you do it? Okay. How can you possibly point to these different aspects of it? How could you ever teach someone what it means to be um, right just by pointing to it? How could you teach something, teach someone uh, a shape just by pointing to it? Right? So you can't actually pick out these things just by pointing. And then Quine, a little bit later, sort of elaborated on this worry in his famous Gabagai um, musings. So the, the Gabagai musings, for those who aren't familiar, basically involve this scenario in which you're in the company of a, of, a, of a speaker of a language you're not familiar with, and a rabbit hops by, and a companion says Gabagai. And the question is, is it safe to assume? Yes. Ah, sure. Hitting my button. Oh, I see. Okay. Are we good now? Yeah? Okay. Cool. Um, so the question is can you ever really be sure that what the speaker is pointing to 
is a rabbit, and that the word for rabbit in this language is gavakai. And Quine's um, worry here is that no, because you cannot tell exactly what the speaker is pointing to and exactly what the, the word gavakai is referring to. And um, at the end of this discussion, he sort of throws up his hands and, and, and puts it this way. Point to a rabbit, and point it to the stage of a rabbit, to an integral part of a rabbit, to the rabbit fusion, and to where rabbithood is manifest. So in other words, there's all these different things you could be pointing to in that act, that seemingly simple act of pointing to the rabbit and saying Gavagai. OK, so now we're, we get to um, one of the ways of seeing a pointing gesture that I want to delve into in a little more depth. And this is sort of more my home turf. So um, this is the idea that pointing is kind of a communicative work for us, that it does a lot of work for us in communication. So pointing gestures are ubiquitous across contexts, um, and in fact have been studied in a number of different contexts. So, so here is sort of a grab bag of different types of naturalistic contexts in which people have studied pointing, in the context of direction giving, during uh, museum visits, um, Chuck Goodwin's work on archaeological digs, in the context of interviews and tours and doctor visits and so on. And um, interestingly, people haven't often attempted to sort of quantify, you know, when you look at naturalistic settings, what are the most common types of gestures that speakers produce? But the few studies that have done this have found that pointing is, in fact, the most common of the gesture classes. So these last two examples here on the right, um, a study that quantified the different types of gestures used in the context of math lectures, both in the US and Japan. And then another study just looking at a, a group of men cooking and chatting after work in Central African Republic. Both of these found that uh, more than 60% of the gestures produced were actually pointing gestures. So. <clears throat> this ubiquity of pointing extends not just to um, pointing, uh, sorry, to, sign, to spoken languages across cultures, but also to sign languages in different sorts of circumstances. So um, one study of uh, home sign in the U.S., so that is the, the kinds of communication systems that are um, created by children who are profoundly deaf from birth and don't have access to a conventional language. In this, in this case, 42% uh, of the signs used were pointing signs. In Katakalic, which is an emerging sign language in Bali, a corpus study found that 17% of the signs were pointing signs. And in British Sign Language, which is, of course, an established national sign language, um, a corpus study recently found that 23% of all signs were pointing signs. So it's ubiquitous in uh, <laughs> sign language, just as it is in spoken language communication. So one question we might want to ask is, why is pointing so pervasive? And here I'm going to just um, highlight three reasons. So one is efficiency. It seems to save verbal effort. A lot of times it's easier to just point to the thing than it is to formulate a precise verbal description of it. And this is something that um, De Girando intuited in 1800 when he wrote, you should really only describe something when you can point it out. Flexibility. So, by pointing, we can, we can actually indicate not just things that are um, with us in the here and now, but we can indicate in a, a much broader universe of possible reference by pointing to empty space that's, that's associated with those reference, by pointing metonymically, that is pointing to, to one thing in order to refer to something that's associated with, and so on. So it's really flexible as a referential tool. And finally, um, the deictic urge, which is unfortunately not something I can go into too much detail about, but it's essentially the idea that people feel a kind of spontaneous urge to connect their discourse to the stuff that's around them. And it would be sort of a separate talk to go into the, the evidence for this. But. OK, so in order for us to really consider pointing uh, a communicative workhorse and not just like flailing that people do when they, when they talk or sign, we need to demonstrate that um, it actually gets across to the listener and it affects listener behavior. And of course, there's plenty of work showing that this is the case. So children understand pointing from a young age, um, from about a year and a half. And when it's um, juxtaposed with speech, 
they actually weight pointing more than speech. So in a study that Thomasella did with Grossman, where they put words in conflict with points, they find that the ch a child will weight the pointing um, more strongly. Adults don't seem able to ignore pointing. So it's processed automatically, and it induces these kinds of Stroop-like effects. Okay, so you really just can't, can't ignore a gesture, a pointing gesture, when you see it. Um, it's been found to speed resolution of ambiguous references in adults. And it's also something that people take into account when processing things like indirect requests, right? If I say something like, it's cold in here, and point to the door, um, people will interpret that as he's saying that the door needs to be shut because it's cold in here. Okay. So on to the idea that pointing is a protean universal. So what do I mean by this? So <clears throat> the prototypical form of pointing, at least in the West, is um, to extend the index finger. And of course, this is where we get the very name index finger, um, right? It's the finger that points. And in case you're wondering, this is not just the case in um, English. This is also the case, of course, in, in most, if not all, European languages, and it's also seen much more widely, so this, the same label is given to the index finger in Iranian, Turkic, and Amerindian languages. So one question is, why is it that we favor the index finger for pointing? What is it about this finger in particular? One explanation that is um, popular was advanced by uh, uh, Povinelli and Davis in 1994. Basically, they showed that if you take the arm of an anesthetized uh, chimp or an anesthetized human, and you hold it up vertically, the um, human's index finger, I see some people are trying it, that's okay, no, yeah, <laughs> don't need to be bashful. Uh, the index finger sort of naturally sticks up relative to the, to the other fingers in humans and not in chimpanzees. Okay, so there, the idea is that there's something just about the biomechanics here that sort of um, naturally affords index finger extension. Another explanation for this, not mutually exclusive, is one um, that George Butterworth made, which is that this kind of posture, this hand posture of extending the index finger is kind of an antithetical posture to one of our most distinctively human hand postures, namely the precision grip posture, where you're opposing the index finger and the um, thumb. Okay, so index finger extension is the prototypical form, but it is not the only form of pointing. Um, pointing is a much bigger class of movements, and this is where the protean comes in. So plenty of other hand shapes are widely used for pointing, even within weird groups. Young children actually, when they first begin to point, go through a stage where they point with the whole hand before they point with the index finger. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit later. <clears throat> in many Western groups, it's been found that when pointing to people, people prefer whole hand morphologies rather than uh, index finger morphologies. We'll also talk about that in a bit. Blind people and sighted people, when you blindfold them, both seem to prefer whole hand pointing. And in some subcultures, other hand shapes are also the preferred one. So if you go to Disneyland, you'll find that the employees are walking around pointing to things with two uh, fingers stuck together like this. And this is reportedly an imitation of Walt Disney's um, way of pointing to things with a cigarette between his um, <laughs> index finger and middle finger. And this is actually sort of enshrined in this statue of Walt at one of the parks. Uh, I think my understanding is that they removed the cigarette at some point <laughs> because it was seen to be kind of passe. Okay, so even within weird groups, we use these other hand morphologies. In some cultures, conventional hand morphologies are much more entrenched. So in this really nice study by David Wilkins, um, looking at Arenta pointing, which is a, an Australian Aboriginal group, he talked about different variants of one finger pointing beyond just the index finger. He talked about whole hand pointing, and then he talked about um, different kinds of highly conventionalized hand shapes that refer to different things. One hand shape, for example, that's not pictured here, 
that's widely used for pointing in the Arante case is a horned hand handshake, which is used when you're talking about um, cardinally oriented paths. So only in the case where you're talking about some sort of cardinal oriented path would you do this kind of pointing. And then when we look beyond the hands, we also see interesting variation. So as many of you will know, there are um, many cultures that have uh, facial pointing conventions. So lip pointing, which is done with um, some kind of pursing or protruding of the lips, is actually found basically worldwide. Um, a discontinuous distribution, of course, but it's found all over the globe. And then nose pointing, which is another facial pointing convention that involves scrunching together the face, um, is also found, but it's restricted to Papua New Guinea. So here is just a little map showing some of the places where there have been scholarly studies on lip pointing and nose pointing. So as you can see, these are actually um, super common. And my colleagues and I have studied this nose pointing case in a little more detail, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a snapshot of some of our work on this gesture in, in Yukna. So this is a group, again, in um, the interior of Papua New Guinea. And we first documented this gesture in 2012, and we were just sort of reporting that there seems to be this alternative facial pointing convention. When we went back on our second field trip, um, we wanted to kind of get a better handle on how often Yukno speakers did this kind of nose pointing relative to other kinds of pointing. They also point by hand. Um, they also point just with their head without any sort of nose pointing. So we wanted to get a sense for how their whole pattern of preferences fell out. So we did this little referential communication task. I'm not going to go into the details, but basically it's a director matcher kind of task where one participant, um, like the guy seated in the middle here, is the director, and he's trying to get his partner to arrange objects in a certain way. And of course, we don't tell them that they should gesture in order to give these instructions, but um, people, again, feel this type to curve, and so naturally do. So here's just a, a brief video clip where you can see how um, this participant instructs his partner. Okay, so that's a transcription of, of what he says there, and if you caught it, I mean, it happens fast for sure. He produces two of these nose pointing gestures in this short sequence. So the first one when he says that one, and then the second one when he says um, bring the white one and put it down there. Yeah. Um, so of course, to to do this study, so we were um, doing trying to do a direct comparison between you know, speakers and U.S. speakers. To do this study, naturally, we had to make sure everyone was on the same playing field. So we had all participants kind of sit in the same um, cross-legged posture with their hands in their laps, so their hands were available for pointing if they so desired. As you can see, he does not so desire to use them. So we broke down the um, we broke down the the pointing gestures that people produced into these uh, this one big big split between manual forms of pointing and non-manual forms of pointing, and then within the manual forms we were interested in how much people used index finger pointing versus, versus other hand shapes, and within the non-manual forms we were interested in how much people just did sort of head pointing, you know, like just sort of tossing your head in a particular direction versus the full-fledged nose pointing where you also do this um, embellishment of scrunching the face together. So in our US sample, um, which was done here in, in California, we found that 98% uh, of the pointing gestures of the around 500 pointing gestures that we documented were um, manual. And there were just a, a little sprinkling of these head pointing gestures. And this contrasted starkly with what our no participants did. So on balance, they actually produced numerically more um, non-manual pointing gestures than um, manual ones. OK. So I hope to have convinced you that, um, again, this pointing gesture, though it may be universal, is actually pretty uh, brilliant. It shows up in different, it shows up in different forms and different contexts. So now on to the idea that pointing is a social tool. So pointing 
sort of definitionally draws attention to regions of space. And it often, it's often doing this to communicate something about those regions. But pointing also is sometimes used in a way that adds social meanings to that basic referential act. Okay? So one of the main social meanings that pointing seems to add is this layer of aggression. Okay? So um, a sort of famous case where this is brought out is the kitchen debate between Nixon and Khrushchev. Um, I'm blanking on the year, I think it's 1959 or something like that. Someone who's, who's alive then maybe can correct me. Um, where there was this, this sort of heated exchanges between Khrushchev and Nixon, and Nixon would actually go on to explicitly talk about, in his sort of memories of this event, that pointing was a, a, one of the reasons why things escalated between them. Khrushchev was poking his finger at me, and so on. And the public also kind of um, keyed in on the, the pointing as a major part of this aggressive interaction, and so you have political cartoons of the time showing these, this kind of exchange of pointing. So interestingly, pointing doesn't just have these kind of negative valences. It also has um, some positive ones. So pointing is often used in the course of greeting, at least in the West. Um, if you go online and search for greeting gifts, you will see um, that a lot of them involve this kind of pointing, often two-handed, sometimes in sort of a, a, gun, a gun posture. It's also used in the course of mockery and um, occasionally to sort of show agreement as when someone says something you agree with and you sort of say yes. <clears throat> so these are all ways that the sort of basic referential act of drawing attention to something is further embellished and gets these, these new meanings. Okay, so in part because of these layers of meaning that pointing takes on, it is also universally a proscribed action. It's one that societies seek to control. <laughs> so, in many places, there is at least the belief, the sort of folk belief, that pointing is rude. Um, when you look up sort of guides to etiquette for various countries, you will almost invariably encounter some version of don't point, it's rude. And often, specifically, they will say um, don't point to people, and especially don't point with your index finger. So this, for example, is a, a cultural etiquette guide to Thailand that I found online. And indeed, even in the US, some people, usually of an older generation, will insist that pointing to people is rude. So you can sometimes find in internet forums people like Dan here, a level four commenter on um, Yahoo Answers, asking, is it still not polite to point? I've noticed these days parents with children are pointing with an outstretched index finger and arm and children are also doing it. I understand that in some cultures, pointing at someone like that is okay. It's fine, that's a different culture. What's going on? You know, why, why, are, why do people think this is okay? So this, um, this taboo on pointing to people is sort of still present in the US, even though if you sort of you know, look around, you'll, you'll, it's not hard to find examples of people pointing to other people. Interestingly, interestingly though, um, even within Western groups where it seems like this taboo is very relaxed, you can still see differences in how people point to people. So this was a study of Polish speakers from 2014, where they basically contrived these scenarios in which people would have to either point to <coughs> objects, I think it was chairs, or point to people. And they found that when people were pointing to the objects, they strongly favored index finger pointing, and when they had to point to people, they were sort of equally likely to point with an index finger or an open palm, or even just uh, by gazing in the direction of the people. So even though there's not a strict taboo, it seems like there's um, a sense in which the taboo still shapes how we point. In a lot of cultures, there are taboos on pointing to specific things beyond people. Um, and this is a really sort of colorful colorful um, patch of the literature that I'll just give you a taste of. So among the Kadang in Indonesia, um, Barnes reports that it is taboo to point to young pumpkins. <coughs> in um, Madagascar, a study reports that it is taboo to point to whales and other charismatic 
marine fauna, um, like giant octopuses and so on. And in many cultures, it is taboo to point to rainbows. In fact, um, Bob Lust very recently has put forward evidence that you can find this taboo essentially on every um, continent. That is, it's discontinuously distributed, but it's present universally. So what's going on here? Why is it taboo to point to these things? Um, the answer seems to lie into, in that sort of aggressive edge, that aggressive layer that pointing adds things. And digging a little deeper, where does this aggressive edge come from? Well, the best, the best answer that I can come up with, this is not something that people have speculated a lot about, the best answer I can come up with is that on this idea that pointing projects this kind of imaginary form, this vector, that form is kind of seen in turn as a sort of puncturing force, as a, as a, a kind of um, sharp and potentially hurtful thing that you're projecting at whatever you're referring to. Some of the evidence for this being the reason for that taboo comes in when we look at ways that you can actually skirt this taboo across cultures. So um, Bob Lust has called this um, category of taboo skirting gestures avoidance dikes. And essentially, these are ways in different cultures where you can mitigate or erase the taboo by just pointing with a different morphology. So an obvious one is just pointing with the whole hand. As we saw, even Westerners like to point to people with the whole hand instead of um, with that sort of puncturing force. In, Aust in Australian Aboriginal groups, in some cases, they point with the fist or the elbow or the knee if it's taboo to point to something. Um, in some groups, including in Malaysia, if you want to avoid pointing with your index finger, you stick your thumb into your fist, sorry, into your, uh, your thumb into your index fingers, crook right there and point like that. And of course, this was what Clinton's advisors um, urged him to do in the 90s when he had this sort of bad habit of um, pointing as a rhetorical gesture like this. And his advisors said, you really need to, to change that up. And so he started doing this thumb pressing gesture, which then became known as the Clinton thumb, and of course became fodder for um, SNL skits and so on. So all of these have something in common, namely that they kind of defang pointing. They take the aggressive edge off the pointing gesture by um, taking something that would have a puncturing force and giving it sort of a more diffuse uh, pointer force. Okay. So I'm going to really quickly go through the ways that pointing has been understood in, in linguistics. First is as a kind of partner of language. So if you look in a um, grammar of, um, you know, a descriptive grammar of a language or a, for, uh, a, a sort of guide for foreign language learners, they're not going to talk a lot about pointing. It's going to go basically unmentioned because it's sort of outside the purview of linguistic theory. The one place where you're going to find it mentioned, however, is in discussion of words like this, that, here, and there, which are sometimes called demonstrative words. And it's long been noticed that pointing has a special relationship to these words, and these words have actually often been called pointing words. Now, um, an, an especially interesting aspect of this partnership between pointing and demonstratives is that demonstratives are considered by some to be the most ancient words in human language, to be kind of sitting at the bedrock of human language. That seems like a preposterous claim, but there's, the evidence for it is, is, is pretty interesting. So it's essentially that if you try to reconstruct the roots of demonstratives, you inevitably fail. They cannot, you, you can't reconstruct them. You cannot break them down into earlier forms. For most other word classes, and including other function words, um, you can do this, right? You can point to some earlier word that is its root. So for example, the word the has as its earlier word the word that, the demonstrative. So the came from that. But you just can't really do this with demonstratives in any language that's been described. So we'll keep that in mind. 
In sign language linguistics, pointing has a sort of different status. It's often considered not just a partner to language, but a part of language, part of the very stuff of grammar. So for example, the pronoun systems in sign languages are made, of, made up of what we would take to be um, pointing gestures. Okay, so to say me, you have a point to the chest. To say you, you have a point to the addressee. Um, to point to him or her, you're pointing into, um, out into space. Pointing also enters into just the lexicon of the language. So not the, the personal pronouns, but just a, a whole broad array of other kinds of concepts. So naturally, in um, body part terms, you see a lot of pointing, pointing to the eye for eye and so on. But you also see pointing going on in sort of more abstract concepts like knowing, which often involves some kind of pointing action toward the head, dreaming, which in a similar way is usually indicating the head in some fashion. These are just a few examples. You can really find pointing sort of pervasively across the sign language lexicon in, in many sign languages, not just these, these two that I'm showing here. Okay, <clears throat> pointing is also um, a fixture of art, not just in the art of Leonardo, as we saw, but much more broadly, and starting much earlier. So you can see uh, representations of the human pointing gesture going back to ancient Egypt, um, and you see it cro uh, across cultures. So here is a Zapotec cornerstone, maybe a little hard to see, but this um, guy has a speech bubble coming out of his mouth and is directing an index finger point upward. Um, the Bayeux Tapestry is a veritable riot of pointing. Here is a, a scene from the tapestry where these, this group of men are pointing up to a comet. And of course, this um, sort of centrality of pointing um, continues through the Renaissance. So this is an example from uh, Caravaggio uh, painting, which involves three different pointing gestures. They're a little hard to see in the in the shadows. William Blake seems to have had a perhaps unhealthy fixation on pointing. Here is his, um, his drawing of Joe being rebuked by his friends. There's a minor tradition of, of this story in which statues seem to be especially fond of pointing. So this is like one of the most common things you'll see statues doing is pointing. Uh, we can talk we can talk later if anyone's interested about why this might be. <clears throat> and this use of pointing in art also spills over into our visual culture more, more generally, where pointing enters as sort of as a central um, graphical icon. So between 1200 and 1800, the most common um, marginalia, the most common uh, notes that people would make in the margins of books were these um, sort of eerie hands that are called manicules for little hands. <clears throat> they often had sort of creepily long fingers or were sort of doing anatomically impossible things in other ways. They often were further embellished. So this is my <laughs> personal favorite manicule, which is um, some kind of fish lizard with a hand coming out of it. And this tradition of drawing these little hands in the margins, margins of books eventually gave way to sort of more regimented, more rigidly stylized hands that were used in um, signage. And by some accounts were so widely used in signage that the um, people essentially got burned out with them and started to detest their usage. And so they kind of fell out of favor in the early 1900s. But of course, they came back. And so uh, more recently, we've come, become familiar with these kinds of graphical hands. So in some graphic user interfaces, the um, cursor kind of alternates with a pointing hand when you, when you scroll over something you can click. And of course, hands have um, come back on the stage in strong fashion with uh, the rise of emoji. OK, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk briefly about this idea that Pointing is not just a tool for directing the attention of others, but also a tool for directing our own attention. In other words, it serves as a kind of cognitive aid or prompt. So in the Japanese railway system, 
Conductors and other railway employees often engage in what is called chisekanko or point and call, which is that at um, certain points, like when you come to a stop, you'll do this whole uh, regimen of pointing to things and, um, and, and saying things as you point to them as a kind of way of making sure you attend to each thing you need to, you need to attend to at that juncture. This kind of behavior has also been studied in more experimental, more controlled contexts. And the most prominent one is when people try to count. So for example, if you give people a task where they have to count how many asterisks there are here, they're going to spontaneously point as they do that. And it's been found that this um, spontaneous pointing behavior is helpful. Right? So both children and adults will count these kinds of things, these kinds of arrays, faster and more accurately if they're allowed to use their hands as they do it. And it's even been found that chimpanzees, when given these kinds of tasks, will engage in spontaneous pointing acts. So there's something about this urge to point, to orchestrate your own attention, that is um, pretty primordial. Okay. We're getting toward the home stretch here, so um, we're now going to talk about pointing as a developmental milestone. So pointing is one of the um, child's very first communicative acts, and it comes in before language. So some of the first pioneering work on this was done by Elizabeth Bates and colleagues. And they made an influential distinction between two different types of pointing. The first they called imperative points which are points that can be glossed as kind of an I want that, give me that. And these were usually done with the whole hand rather than the index finger. The second was what they called declarative points, which could be glossed as isn't that cool or look at that. And these were usually done with the index finger. Um, it has since been found that universally, or to, to the best of our knowledge universally, pointing emerges as this kind of pre-linguistic universal, okay? So this is a, a really nice study by Ophlitskowski and colleagues that looked at seven different cultures, looked at mother-infant pairs in seven different cultures, and they found that across all these cultures, whole hand pointing emerged first at around eight months, and then a little bit later, usually around 11 months, you see index finger pointing emerging. So they didn't actually code for that distinction between imperative and declarative pointing, but it does seem to be that these distinctive handshapes come in first as a kind of imperative point and only later as a kind of declarative point. So there seem to be four different accounts for why it is that infants start to point at this time. What, what it is that's going on that um, leads to this sudden emergence of this pre-linguistic universal. The first is that pointing is a kind of ritualized reach. This was an idea from Vygotsky and from Wundt. And it's sort of this idea that the, the child starts by just reaching for things they want, and then they quickly learn that by reaching toward things that they want but can't get, they actually get those things because the adult gets an adult gets it for them. So then this becomes abbreviated into just a pointing gesture. The second is that people, sorry, that, that um, children pick up pointing really just by imitating adults. They just see that adults point to things all the time and so they start doing it themselves. Um, this seems like a pretty common sense theory, but it actually turns out to be sort of problematic. So there was a, a recent paper that did a training intervention where they trained children right before they would start to point normally, so around 10 months old. They just expose them to like a, you know, a bonanza of pointing, and it didn't matter. It didn't affect how early they started pointing or how much they started pointing. So they seem sort of impervious to seeing a lot of pointing. A third idea is that pointing emerges spontaneously as a self-orienting act, as that kind of cognitive prop, before it actually becomes co-opted as a communicative prop. And there is some interesting evidence for this. So, so people have found that um, just as children talk to themselves, they often also point for themselves. Um, there's a nice study on this by Deloche and colleagues. Then the last of the four theories 
is the idea that pointing first emerges out of object exploration. So children, before they ever start um, pointing, will often explore objects with their index fingers. So the idea is that pointing comes from that. And this is actually a, <coughs> this last one is a sort of account that's recently been given a bit of a boost, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about this experiment that found some interesting things. So this is Omadigain and colleagues. And they found that if you look closely at the form of pointing in both kids and adults, you actually see that what they seem to be doing is, is simulating touch. So in a first experiment, they um, looked at this by just having people point to an array of objects on, a, on the wall like this. And what they wanted to see was, if you look at the angle of the finger, are they actually um, pointing as though they're projecting that imaginary vector to what they're referring to, or are they doing something different? And what they found is that often the finger is just pointing um, like way out of the, the, the zone of interest. And instead, it looks like what people are doing is lining up their line of sight and the tip of their index finger, as though they're trying to just contact the thing that they're pointing to. A second study, I think, provides an even nicer demonstration of this. So they had children and adults point to try to point to these stars that were on the sides of this three-dimensional box. Now, if you're trying to point to this star, you could, of course, just point, like, keep your, um, keep your hand um, at a sort of normal horizontal plane like this. But what they found is that people actually would tilt their arm, and it's even more pronounced when they're pointing to this side of the box, tilt their arm as though they're trying to touch it with their finger rather than just project the vector toward the finger. Sorry, project the, the vector toward the star. So this is still a lively, lively debate, but I think this most, this most recent entry into it um, is worth uh, thinking about. So however pointing begins, one thing that is clear is that it seems to kind of pave the way for what comes next, namely full-blown linguistic communication. So in 2003, Butterworth sort of famously described pointing as the royal road to language for babies, and there is a ton of evidence that has borne this out. In 2010, there was a nice meta-analysis of 25 studies that have looked at um, the relationship between pointing and, and language development. And what they find is that earlier pointing and more pointing reliably predict um, more sophisticated language abilities. And they find some pretty strong correlations between pointing and language abilities, both concurrently, as in how much you point now predicts how well you talk now, and also longitudinally, as in how much you point now, predicts how much you will talk later. But an interesting wrinkle is they only find this correlation for declarative pointing, not for imperative pointing. So there seems to be something especially special, if you like, about those declarative index finger points. Okay. Pointing has also often been seen as a diagnostic window, as something that can give us a glimpse into the future. <clears throat> and in particular, it's been um, serving as this kind of diagnostic window in the case of various developmental issues. So, um, for example, people trying to diagnose primary language delay in infants have observed that infants who only point with their whole hands, who only do that whole hand pointing, that more imperative style of pointing, at 12 months seem to be at greater risk for language delay at two years. In children with, um, with uh, brain damage in infancy, they find that pointing at 18 months predicts their vocabulary at two years. As many of you, of you may have heard, pointing is delayed or altogether absent in autism spectrum disorders. And again, in those cases, it seems to be that declarative style of pointing that seems to be missing. Pointing is also delayed or absent in Williams syndrome. Interestingly, in Williams syndrome, you have this case where you have superior vocabulary at a young age, but you don't have any pointing abilities intact. So it's kind of an, an inversion of what you see in other cases. All right, so the last one that I want to dive more deeply into is this idea that pointing is a cross-species litmus test. 
So it's long been sort of taken as a um, truism that our great ape cousins do not point in the wild. But this has also occasionally been challenged. So here are some um, field observations made in Zaire by Vea and Sabater P, who were studying bonobos. And they write in very cinematic fashion, I will say, <coughs> noises are heard coming from the vegetation. A young male swings from a branch and leaps into a tree. He emits sharp calls, which are answered by other individuals who are not visible. He points, with his right arm stretched out and his hand half closed except for his index and ring fingers, to the position of two groups of camouflaged observers. So for a long time, this was the one account of spontaneous pointing in great apes. Not super compelling as um, you know, an end of one observation, I would, I would say. Since there's been more of these kind of accounts of spontaneous pointing in great apes in the wild, um, and Hobater et al. have a nice paper reporting some additional observations, but even they acknowledge that if pointing is spontaneously produced in the wild among great apes, it is vanishingly rare. We do know, however, and have known for a while, that our great ape cousins point in captivity. Here's an example of um, a chimpanzee pointing with that index finger morphology. And of course, language-trained chimpanzees, um, for example, Nim Chimsky, I believe, this is Nim, use pointing as part of their conventional um, repertoire. So if you see in the upper left there, his sign for me is pointing twice, uh, sorry, with two hands to his guard. One thing you might be thinking is, okay, what, well, what about dogs? We have pointer dogs, right? So dogs point and chimps don't. That's interesting. Well, this is actually turns out to be a little bit of a um, misnomer. So what pointer dogs do is when they see a quarry of interest, they adopt this stereotype posture that in some cases looks like this, paw up. Um, they're, they're kind of making an arrow of their body toward the, the quarry. But there's no evidence that this is actually serving as any kind of flexible, intentional, declarative signal for the owner, right? It's just sort of a, a, um, a, a baked-in kind of uh, behavioral profile that they use when they see something that is of interest to them. So it does not seem to be a case of referential pointing. Dogs do seem to understand pointing, however. So there's been a lot of work um, recently on dogs' ability to comprehend pointing as a human cue. And here we find that very often they can. So much of this work has used what's called the object choice um, paradigm, where you have a human pointing out a food reward in one of two locations. The early work on this found that um, domestic dogs are able to follow this kind of cue, no problem. And wolves, as pictured on the right, are not able to. This led to a whole story about how it must be our, co our history of coevolution with domestic dogs that allows them to do this. But um, since we've actually learned that the, the story is, is a little more nuanced, what seems to be going on is that interactions with a human over the course of, um, of the animal's lifespan are what really determine whether it can understand pointing. Its evolutionary lineage seems to be somewhat beside the point. Uh, feral dogs who haven't had contact with humans do not follow pointing. Wolves who have had contact with humans do follow pointing. A really nice review of this work um, was recently put out by Kraus et, al. Kraus et al. in 2018, and they cover studies on pointing production and comprehension in 38 different species. Um, this is really a booming area. This literature includes 57 publications on pointing in dogs and 28 on pointing in chimps. chimps. Most of this using that sort of um, uh, object choice paradigm that I just looked at. They've really uh, kind of gone through the whole gamut of species here, looking at pointing comprehension in sea lions, bats, horses, and many others. <clears throat> Overall, the generalization that you can take away is that pointing comprehension seems to be predicted by, again, interaction with humans over the animal's lifespan and not by um, quirks of evolutionary history. So my overall takeaway from this is that while pointing may not be kind of uniquely a uniquely human capacity, um, animals do seem able to understand these signals. In some cases, as in the case of captive chimps, they're able to produce them. It is certainly a distinctively human proclivity 
So, wrapping up with our 15th way that pointing has been viewed. <clears throat> so looking across these different ways um, that we've, we've talked about, we've seen that pointing is sort of putatively simple, that it appears to be ancient, that it's developmentally privileged, that it may be distinctively human as a proclivity. So why not also think that pointing is somehow primordial, that it's one of the very first um, communicative signals we came to use on our road to um, using full-blown language. And in fact, many have thought this. Um, so, so, so one of the most well-developed accounts of this comes from the Vietnamese philosopher Tran Duc Tho, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, who in 1984 kind of spun this whole tale about the origins of consciousness from pointing on the savannas. More prominently, uh, Michael Tomasello in 2008 has built an account of the origins of human communication that start with pointing as a sort of um, fundamental embodiment of this kind of uh, cooperative mode that he sees as distinctively human. Now, this idea that pointing sort of sets the stage for later language has actually been around for much longer. Um, Carl Bühler, a uh, German linguist was commenting on this, what he called the myth of the deictic origins of language back in the 30s. And he wrote that, you know, the, this myth seems to be in, increasingly popular, that what is specifically human begins with the genuine deictic gesture and then everything else just spins out from it. And he sort of lampoons this idea, but then comes around at the end to saying that myths need not be false. So, um, just because people have seized on this idea without a whole lot of evidence doesn't mean that it's wrong. And in fact, we don't really have uh, a sort of better account. Okay. So over the course of the talk, we've seen that pointing this seemingly simple kind of humble, humble behavior has been seen quite widely and variously across different spheres of um, intellectual life. And... <coughs> You know, one thing that Liz Bates, who um, that we talked about earlier, who has made some really important contributions to the study of pointing, one thing that she observes in her 1979 book is that once you've looked at a phenomenon for long enough, it sort of seems to take on this kind of cosmic importance. That it's easy to see a whole universe in a grain of sand and to kind of overinflate the importance of something. So there's some, there's some possibility that that's what um, I and other researchers have been doing in this pointing world. But, you know, <clears throat> I do want to say that there, there have been plenty, aside from Liz Bates and myself, who have seen something special in pointing. As we've seen, these um, folks have included semioticians, philosophers, anthropologists, um, interaction researchers, and many others. And as we also saw at the very beginning, Leonardo um, seemed to see a sort of cosmic importance in pointing, in pointing, or at least found something special in pointing. So I wanted to briefly revisit, revisit this question of why he was, quote, mesmerized by this gesture um, in the words of his biographer. So I would argue, and this is purely in the realm of speculation, but I would argue that his obsession was not really with pointing per se, but with attention, more generally. Um, we know from other of his writings and works that he was intensely interested in the anatomy of attention, the anatomy of the eye, and in the geometry of attention, the sort of um, dynamics of perspective. And so he may have been drawn to, to pointing precisely because he realized that it's sort of an unsurpassed <coughs> tool for manipulating attention, and a tool that he, as an artist, could um, use to his advantage. So I think this, this um, sort of speculative answer for why Leonardo was so drawn to pointing can also give us an answer to this question of why so many scholars, why so many different subfields have been drawn to pointing. And that answer is that we are fundamentally creatures of attention. We seem to have this special preoccupation with monitoring attention, with controlling others' attention. And the pointing gesture is a kind of overt, ubiquitous, and really early emerging embodiment of this preoccupation with attention. So just to put a finer point on it, 
<coughs> I would say that the most interesting thing about pointing is not really the gesture itself, but what it points to. And here I'm going to um, draw on the words of uh, Bruce Lee from Enter the Dragon. So he famously popularized the Zen koan about pointing to the moon, and he wrote, or sorry, he said, it's like a finger pointing a way to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger, or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Okay, so this is a parable about how you can't focus on the thing itself, but what it points to. And in this case, what pointing points to is, I think, this kind of distinctively human preoccupation with attention. Okay, that is it. Thank you. Um, yes, there is a full manuscript of this available if anyone uh, dares delve in. There's a lot more detail there, but thank you all. I'll let you take care of it. All right. Yes. Your interests extend to other use of the hand and finger and gestures and how they are culturally, how they arise culturally and do they appear and disappear like slang words. I'm thinking of, you know, the Hawaiian, the clenched mm -hmm. fist, the A-OK, -okay, the V for victory. Mm -hmm. And if I could, in a separate way, do you have any information or, or knowledge about a patient who has an expressive aphasia from a stroke? Do they then have more pointing and gesturing, or do they lose the ability coincident with the loss of expressive speech? Yeah, interesting, um, interesting question. So just to take the first one first, um, Yes, in short, yeah, I, I am interested in all kinds of uses of the hand expressively and cross-cultural variation and, and so on. Um, as for the aphasia, I, I think the best work on this um, remains the work that Chuck, Didwin, uh, Chuck Goodman did on uh, Chill, his father, where he found that, um, you know, despite a sort of devastating aphasia that knocked out all but, I think, the words yes, no, and maybe one kind of one other word. Um, he used pointing really to amazing effect to conduct these kind of um, sophisticated interactions and tell stories and so on. So um, as far as I know, there's there's no sense in which aphasia also knocks out pointing abilities. Yeah. Yes. Uh, really fascinating talk. Um, thanks for all this amazing uh, background to this topic. Um, I was wondering, on, on your last point, where you discussed some of the evolutionary theory theories that have been used in this realm, if um, one thing that occurs to me is that uh, human society is pretty unique among um, hominoids in the amount of time that we spend away from each other, um, it, outside of physical contact, over the, over the horizon uh, from one another. And, has there been work to look at how pointing, um, the, the likelihood of using a, a pointing gesture versus a, a lip gesture mm -hmm. or nose pointing or elbow pointing or other ways that you could use uh, gestures to indicate direction uh, and distance? Does, does, the, does the pointing gesture become more frequently observed when objects are, ref are, are over the horizon? Is that something that has ever been looked at? Um. The short answer is no, that is not, has not looked at to my knowledge. But so are you suggesting, let me make sure I understand that. So you're suggesting that if humans are, if, if the um, pointer and the addressee are apart from each other, that you'd be more likely to point with your hand? Or are you saying if you're, what you're pointing to is What you're away? pointing to. So oh, okay. like thinking about when you point to something that's a greater distance away, if you can imagine doing it with a, a laser pointer versus right. a flashlight the error that's going to be generated by using something like a fist or a nose um, hmm. would be reduced, and it, it's more consequential to have precision when you're hmm. uh, thinking of pointing something that's two or three kilometers away. So you might want to, that added precision that a, that, a, that a pointing gesture would give you would seem to matter for referring to far away objects. Right, right. Yeah, so it's a great, um, 
It's a great question, and it's uh, an interesting set of issues. So I didn't really, you know, one of the many things that I didn't really get to go into in this talk is, um, you know, when we were studying this nose pointing in, in Yukno, we were, of course, interested in why they're doing so much more non-manual pointing than English speakers, and also interested in why it is that in indigenous culture after indigenous culture, you see reports of heavy reliance on facial pointing in contrast to manual pointing. There seems to be some, there's got to be some generalization. So we were kind of casting about for sure. explanations yeah. like, yeah. like this, and we do discuss the, the relationship between these different point, pointing forms and precision. It's not quite as simple as the further away, the more precise um, you need to point, right? So, for example, in you know um, high high literacy graphic, graphically intensive cultures like ours, we're often pointing to small characters and inscriptions, um, where we need that precision, even though they're right in front of us. Um, yeah. So there is. There, the, the pre precision is an important thing to keep in mind, but I don't have a yeah. clear story for how it could explain the, yeah. you know, the pattern in one kind of fell swoop. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you if you ask, what's your what's your intuition though? If you ask the same folks to do a description of bringing this and object A to place B, and and it was <coughs> yeah not within visual. Right. Site, but it was something you know around the next house or around the bend or outside of. Right. Do you do you have naturalistic I, observations that would allow you to look at that? Um, I don't think we have naturalistic observations that are that are would allow us to do that. Okay. Um, we've talked about as a follow-up study manipulating how much precision is needed to refer to the different objects, mm -hmm. so we could look at this cool. exactly this issue. Yeah. Um, but you can manipulate the precision needed in a bunch of different ways. Distance is one. You can also introduce competitors. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I if you have to point to something over here, but it's all alone, then you don't need much precision. But if I put a competitor object right next to it, then suddenly yeah. you do need precision. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about doing something like that because our intuition is that you're gonna you're gonna use the manual forms when you need more precision. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, one thing we talk about there is how. You know, English speakers might be wasting effort a lot of times because they're they're always using this form that's more effortful than just a kind of head mm -hmm. head gesture or whatever. Even though the precision is totally unnecessary, um, it's kind of an over overextension of their resources. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering. Um, my first question of many numbers. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of where the audience is in relation to the pointer, hmm. and does that affect the forms of pointing gestures that you see, and in particular, you know, thinking about your own experience in setting up um, experiments in the field. You know, hmm. if you have the, if you're sitting next to someone and asking them to indicate things versus you're sitting across from them, do those kinds of experimental details matter in yeah. these elicitation studies? Hmm. Yeah, so my intuition is that it definitely would matter. Unfortunately, the amount of work that's done elicitation studies um, on pointing is vanishingly small. I mean, you kind of like saw most of it here. Um, and in that study, um, in that paradigm that we developed, we kind of just decided to leave this issue aside. So we didn't control at all where the listener was in relation to the, the pointer. I mean, we basically had it set up so that the pointer was um, you know, facing this kind of uh, activity area, as you, as, if you want to call it that. And then the listener was kind of just moving in and out of the activity area, so there wasn't really control over that. But you can imagine, like, yeah, if you're sitting next to someone, um, you know, you're you you're sort of sharing a perspective, and so different considerations come in, like, how do I get them to follow this vector precisely? Like, maybe you do like a lean in or like that sort of thing. So it certainly could it certainly could matter. I don't have a, like a clear like this is exactly how it would matter here is like the consideration, but. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, thanks for me talk. Um, I was wondering, I know there's like been a lot of comparative research on eye gaze following, mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you see that as like a, or if there's been research maybe on this, is it an important part of understanding or comprehending pointing, like following the gaze in humans, and then is that also something that you see as uniquely human, um, having a theory of mind? Or right, right, right. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's um, a good one, and it sort of 
you kind of put your finger on a, a, a little bit of a blind spot in my own understanding of this area. So I don't know much about the, the, the gaze following literature, but the answer is yes, I do think it is an important part of this, so I need to fill in, fill in that gap. Um, you know, one thing you might wonder is, well, if humans are such good gaze followers, which we are, then why is why also are we such good pointers? What is the you know why do we have this additional cue that we use? Um, and I think that's not something I've thought about a ton, but I would say that it, it, you probably want to build a story there about um, the importance of ostensive cues in humans as opposed to just sort of informative cues, right? Um, like my if I follow your gaze, that informs me about what you're looking at, what you're thinking, but it doesn't inform me about what you want me to know, necessarily, right? And so the development of pointing can be seen as a development of a kind of more ostensive version of gazing. And in fact, some people have actually described pointing as a kind of um, doing a sort of performance of looking, like I am performing to you that I am looking at this thing, and so I want you to see that I'm looking at this thing. Um, but yeah, thanks for that, because I, I, I do need to like figure out how the gaze following fits in. Because I, I know there has been a lot of comparative work on this, and I don't I just don't know it. Maybe someone in the room can enlighten me at some point, but I don't I don't know much about um, how different species gaze follow versus understand points and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you can. Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. I had uh, a couple of questions about uh, some like if you have about the ethnographic literature piece mm -hmm. again. So mm -hmm. the information that you provided was mostly about the restrictions on the types of things to which you can mm -hmm. point, but I was wondering if in those accounts they had sort of explicit theorization as to why, like what makes a point rude as opposed to not rude, because, you know, I, I, I'm wondering sort of what the the causal sort of mm -hmm. story is there about how it how it acquires this right. sort of rudeness uh, when you point to like people or agents or whatever. So do you, do you have any information on that? Um, I mean the grossest generalization, you know, like I showed that slide of like the young pumpkins and the sea creatures and the rainbows. I, I mean the basic generalization there is that things that are um, especially esteemed or thought to be sacred or hi highly valued are, are going to be more likely to be um, you know, the subjects of these kinds of pointing techniques, right? And in terms of why it is that pointing is something you don't want to do to these objects, I, we don't really have a good story other than to say that pointing is aggressive, and then we might want to know why is pointing aggressive, and that's why I introduced this idea that pointing seems to be universally understood as a kind of projecting some kind of puncturing force, so sort of uh, an almost lethal act, albeit a kind of, you know, imaginary lethal act. Yeah, did you want to? Yeah, can I just ask a yeah, follow-up sure. to that? Yeah. So um, if that, I, I guess I want to press a little bit on this hypothesis of mm -hmm. it being sort of a puncturing force. Yeah. I mean, do you have any evidence to suggest that in places where, you know, like your field site where you're working with the... Mm -hmm. The Yubno, yeah. Yeah, with the Yubno. Um, do you see, like, across cultures, any evidence to suggest that the relative ratio of you know, index finger points to uh, like lip points or other sorts of points are not being like proscribed against? Like can you point, can you lip point at people basically without that being taken aggressively? Yeah, so in a lot of these groups you can, um, a lot of, let me just pull up that one of those slides really quick. The, the, the short answer, though, that is that this is a great question. There's not a lot of work on it. So I'm really kind of grasping, not grasping at straws, but I'm grasping at a few observations. But, um, oh, I don't need Wi-Fi. So um, these sort of, as, 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 as my evidence for this puncturing force idea, these are sort of, these different morphologies for pointing are all cases um, I didn't put a lot of detail on this slide, but a lot of these come from, from different societies, cases where there's some alternative to index finger pointing that you can do that is not seen as taboo. And they all seem to involve, you know, removing some of this, blunting this 
this force. And I didn't put a uh, lip pointing up here, but that is one of the ones where, like in, in some groups where you can't um, point to a rainbow, you can lip point to the rainbow. Um, but again, this is, this is sort of, I'm sort of grasping at a small number of observations. But it is, it is, a, good, it is a good question. Yeah. Thanks. Did, was there a question over there? Yeah, I was just going to follow up on what Sasha was um, okay. asking. Yeah. That's my question, too. Um, thinking about the relationship between pointing and, and um, attention and trying to direct others' attention. Um, I'm thinking about that a lot in Capuchins. They don't do a point like that, but they do sort of point with their heads. And I think, I'm sure Thomas Sullivan said it's not a point, but for example, if I'm mad at you and I want Erica to help me do bad things to you, I'll go like, hmm. You know, so it's, it's, hmm. it's a very, by, by jerking, <laughs> right. the, uh, by, by the movement, and the, the jerky movements, too, in a way, from something that they're kind of pointing with their, with their head and with their right. gaze. Um, and I don't really know the extent to other species, yeah. to which other species do that. I think baboons and macaques kind of do that, too, don't they? But, um, Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it's totally possible that, I've, I've gotten this question before of, well, is it possible that we've just been so fixated on the index finger, because that's our prototypical understanding of what pointing is, that we've missed the fact that other species might actually do non-manual pointing? Yeah. And I don't. I, I think it's possible. Um, it's it's one of these things where it's hard to demonstrate that that's a kind of a, an ostensive cue, right. and not just um, you know them looking. You're, you're looking to Erica because you want Erica's help, and you know you're mm -hmm. not trying to signal that to anyone. You're just mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a hard thing to to get at in a way that would satisfy Tom Sello. Yeah, he's very hard to satisfy. <laughs> right. but, um, but I think they are trying to get, so this really jerky um, action, they'll do it only when they are trying to get someone's help against a predator or a kind specific. Hmm. Um, so has anyone, has anyone studied this and just called it something other than pointing, or? Mm, yeah, kind of. I mean, it's called a head flag. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah. I haven't really come up here, but that, yeah, that's interesting. I would right. definitely look, look that up. And uh, they don't, they don't do um, attempt. They don't attempt to direct others' attention to objects like good things to eat or something like that. So in that case, there is gaze following, but there isn't any kind of sort of pointing at right. the thing with the head the way there is with the, the aggressive, the solicitation of Alex. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So a, a couple of follow-ups. Um, at first, it seems to me that I've been thinking about this for a while that the, the place to look most easily, perhaps, for a non human analog would be in elephants because they have this incredibly dexterous trunk, right? Mm -hmm. And it has affordances for the direction of the animal's attention. Right. Um, and they're very social and civilized, and they pay a lot of attention to what others are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I've never seen Susan's conclusions in the wild, but I've seen plenty of films of head flagging from her, and it, it's unambiguously signaling. Oh, it, it, it is not simply sort of, you know, um, moving one's attention from one to the other. And for that matter, humans do the same thing. So, um, you know, I, I'm a cyclist. I can track stand for a minute or two, but I can't track stand for a long time. And when I come to a, an intersection where there's a driver, at the intersection, and we're each waiting for the other to go. I need the other driver to go, right? I can't. Right. I can't stand there forever. I'll fall over, and I can't let go of the brakes, or I'll fall over. So I head flag, and it, unambiguously, people understand what you mean. And you don't just look over here and then look right. there. Right. You jerk your head. Yeah, that it's way. a marked. Yeah, yeah it's it, a marked it, 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 It's quite clear. So I think there are probably other examples like that. Um, in, you know, if you, if you broaden your <coughs> search, it, it strikes me that um, I mean I'm quite skeptical of your. Um, explanation for the aggressive nature of the finger point. I mean, this, this strikes me as, um, uh, although overall I'm very impressed with the enterprise that you're doing, but that strikes me as the kind of armchair anthropology of the 1940s, 1950s, where we, ah, it seems like this is going on. I mean, in, in, until you present me with evidence that people actually have this folk theory that that's what's going on. And there, you know, one can envision cognitive experiments where um, uh, you could test that. Um, it sounds to me like a just-so story, and, and instead I would say that any sustained directed attention in, certainly in primates and especially in great apes, um, is aggressive, right? So you talk about gaze, if you just stare at another individual instead of making eye contact and glancing away, that's an aggressive action, right? 
So this is not aggressive. This is aggressive. Right? It's just the sustained attention that's the, that's the issue there. I don't think there's any invisible force. I don't think there's any, um, you know, any folk theory behind it. I mean, there may be secondary to it, but phylogenetically, I'm sure it's the sustained attention. And so, yes. by virtue of that, you know, when you expand your comparative search, I bet you'll find that anything that looks like an analog of pointing can be used in an aggressive mm -hmm. in encounter as a function of um, sustained attention. Yeah. So um, thanks for that pushback because I agree that it, it needs to be it needs to be more backing than just the yeah you know, the kind of armchair analysis I have here. Um, so that is the other account that I've seen uh, for pointing for, for why pointing seems to universally have an aggressive edge to it is that it's basically like staring and staring is of course aggressive. Um, but then the question for me is why do you also see this broadly distributed idea? that you can point to something as long as it doesn't have this index finger morphology. Um, the generalization doesn't seem to be that you can point to something as long as it do it's done fast, right? It's that you have to not use that index finger. So that's the kind of thing I'm trying to explain with this um, idea of pointing as an imaginary force, which, by the way, is not my idea. That's something that independent of this question of taboo, as people have talked about, that people imagine a, a, a vector when they see a pointing gesture. Um, just as they imagine vectors coming from the eyes, right? That's an old medieval theory of optics, right? that you shoot rays out of your eyes and so on, get rays from, from the outside world. So I'm totally with you that there needs to be more evidence, but I, I, I'm not sure that staring is the easy, obvious, you know, alternative account. Uh, I, it could play, they could, they could be sort of both parts of the story, actually. So I, I worked in a place where there's lip pointing, um, and I wasn't interested in this question at the time, so I don't know the answer now, it was a long time ago, but... Um, there were two contexts, it seemed to me, where people used their pointing, um, more than finger pointing. And one was when their hands were busy, okay, so yeah. it's just a standard kind of affordance situation, right. right? And the other is when they actually wanted the signal to be relatively covert. Okay? Right, right. So, um, you know, you're, you know, making some inside joke crack down of, of another party present, and you gesture it with very quickly with your lips so that mm -hmm. only people who are looking directly at your face can see that gesture as opposed to if you just point it over there with your yeah. hand, right? My bet, and I have no idea, this is pure speculation on my part, but I bet, you know, this can be aggressive too, right, if you hold it there long enough. Um, uh, and um, the, you know, the acceptability of it hinges on its um, not indicating sustainable. That, that you know, staring at a rainbow long enough, pointing at it with your knee, whatever it is, that those are those are bad things to do too. Okay. Um, uh, because lip pointing for a long time at someone, in this context, in my memory of it, you know, decades ago, was rude, right? Yeah. So I mean, you you presented a nice, um, you know, experimental test we could do where you manipulate the morphology of the point and you manipulate the um, the duration that it's held and you see which seems to matter for people's judgments of how inappropriate this is. I think that'd be right to do. Um, I don't have a strong intuition either way. Um, I think they probably both could matter. Um, I agree that the sustained attention has to be somewhat part of the story. Um, yeah. Yes? Can you take the moderator's prerogative and ask the last question? Yes. Sorry. Um, so I uh, it's actually two questions, but they're really short. So one was, um, what about pointing with objects? Which I know you didn't really touch on, but just kind of coming off of this, you know, idea of is there a sharp vector? You know, if you point with to some, if you're pointing with a pen versus, you know, pointing with a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Is there, does, does anyone know, are there any theories about when it's okay to point with what kinds of objects? Like I presume pointing with a knife is more threatening than a right. teddy bear. Um, and then my, um, Sort of uh, second question is just with um, coming back to, to your theory that Leonardo was preoccupied um, with attention, mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. Uh, and one the one thing that really jumps out to me is you know the whichever the, this the Saint John's right, Marcus, yeah. um, which you know you see all the time. But but I what I find really striking is that there you get this mismatch between gaze and, and right. point, which yeah. is very unusual. Right. And so I'm wondering whether that's if he really is interested in the like playing with attention and right. manipulating yeah. that. Is that something that you see more often in his work? Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've never thought to do anything more than this kind of um, really sort of yeah, armchair speculative uh, analysis of Leonardo, but 
Yeah, it could be. I mean, I agree that, that that's a really nice observation. That is the second thing about that, is that there's all kinds of different attention dynamics going on there. Um, so yeah, that would be fun to look at more closely. And then your first question about the teddy bear versus knife, no one has done that, but that's another big manipulation <laughs> to the, in addition to um, just lip pointing versus finger pointing, we can add the teddy bear and the knife condition and the sustained teddy bear versus, you know, I'm guessing that even a sustained teddy bear is not going to be seen as aggressive. That's just my speculation. We have a lot of papers by the end of the day. <laughs> um, all right, please join me in thanking our speakers.